The frantic female voice you just heard was that of Denise Amber Lee. Denise had secretly called 911 while blindfolded and restrained in the backseat of a car. She desperately tried to tell the 911 operator as much information as possible before her captor caught her on the phone and the call went silent. It was the only chance Denise had to reach out for help, yet hers would not be the only call to 911 regarding her kidnapping that day. In the end, it would be one of many attempts that would fail to save her life. Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Denise Lee, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. Meet Denise Amber Lee, a 21-year-old woman who was happily married to the man of her dreams and was raising two children whom she adored. Denise met her husband, Nathan Lee, in high school. Their love for each other grew rapidly, and soon after graduation, they married. Not long after tying the knot, the newlyweds were blessed with a son, Noah. Two years later, they had another baby boy, Adam. Having started a family so soon out of high school, Nathan and Denise were not exactly financially stable. Denise was a stay-at-home mother, and Nathan had to work three jobs just to make ends meet. Still, their financial burdens did not interfere with their family's happiness. We were going through what most people would say some tough times. You know, we had two little kids, and we were young. Money wasn't necessarily on our side. It didn't phase us. We, were, we knew we were going to be fine, and we knew we were, you know, going to grow old together. For the money-tight couple, housing options were limited. However, they found a newly built rental home at an affordable price in Northport, Florida. The location of the house allowed the couple to be close to both of their parents. It was situated in a rural area that was quiet, though Denise's parents likened it more to a ghost town. It was a newly constructed subdivision that had many houses that were still left vacant after the housing market crash of 2008. Denise's father, Rick Goff, and her mother expressed concerns about their daughter and her family living in such an isolated setting. Despite that, he understood that the home was a great deal for the couple who had limited resources. For Nathan and Denise, home and neighborhood appeared as a financial blessing that would allow them to raise their children in their own home in a quiet and peaceful community. At least, that's what they thought. It was an unusually warm and muggy day in Northport, Florida on January 17, 2008. At 11.09 a.m., Nathan called Denise to chat during his lunch break. The two talked for about five minutes. During their conversation, Nathan asked Denise to turn off the central cooling system and open up the windows of the house to help save money. Denise let him know that she already had. Nathan got off work at 3 p.m. and he called Denise to let her know that he was on his way home, but she didn't respond. Nathan tried calling her eight more times during his 25-minute drive home. It was odd not to have a response from Denise, but he didn't become concerned until he reached their house. While pulling into the driveway, Nathan noticed all of the windows in the house were closed, though Denise had told him that she had opened them. Upon entering the home, he found no sign of Denise anywhere. A check of the children's room revealed that both were sleeping in the same crib together, something that Denise had never done before. He found Denise's phone, keys, and purse still in the house. Despite the heat, the windows of the house were all closed but not secured. Another odd observation. After thoroughly searching for Denise in the home, he found no trace of her. Nathan became highly concerned. Nathan immediately called 911. The call was made at 3.29 p.m. Northport Emergency? Uh, yes, um, I'm at 7912 uh, Latour Avenue. Uh, mm -hmm. I just got home from work and my wife, I can't find her. My kids were in the house and I don't know where she is. I've looked every single place. Everything looked normal. It's just the only thing that wasn't normal was the fact that obviously Denise wasn't there. After getting off the phone with the 911 operator, Nathan called his father-in-law, Rick. 
Rick was a police sergeant with 25 years experience at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office. Rick was expecting a call from Denise and Nathan because he had invited them to come over for dinner that evening. He had called and left a message on Denise's phone. Rick, however, was not expecting the news he received. Nathan informed Rick that he had called 911. Having 25 years of experience in law enforcement, Rick understood the often lack of attention given to reports of spouses suddenly going missing. He made it his mission to convince the Northport Police Department running the investigation that his daughter was the missing person and that it needed to be given immediate attention. Rick also reached out to his chief and co-workers at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Department, pleading with them to do all they could to help him find his daughter. They were more than happy to lend a hand. First, police headed over to the Lee residence. They began visiting their neighbors' homes to see if anyone knew anything about Denise's disappearance. The police came across one neighbor, Jennifer Eckert, who said that she had seen a suspicious person driving around the neighborhood who later pulled into the Lee's driveway. Jennifer provided police with a description of the vehicle, a green Chevrolet Camaro. With that information in hand, the police department sent out a BOLO, a be on the lookout alert for Charlotte County. The BOLO went out at 6.35 p.m., about three hours after Nathan reported Denise missing. The BOLO stated that the green Chevrolet Camaro had been seen around Toledo Blade Boulevard and US 41 near the Charlotte County Northport line. At 6.14 p.m., a 911 operator received a phone call from a woman screaming and crying loudly into the phone. The caller identified herself as Denise. Rick and Nathan were informed of the disturbing 911 call and they asked to listen to the recording to verify whether or not the caller was in fact their Denise. Both were at Nathan's home at that time. After hearing the recording, the family recognized their greatest fears had come true. Denise had been kidnapped and was in grave danger. Denise somehow got a hold of her captor's cell phone and dialed 911. She desperately tried to relay information to the operator while pretending to be talking to her kidnapper. While pleading for her life, Denise did her best to answer the operator's questions. She successfully provided the operator with her name, street address, the make and color of the captor's car. She also let the operator know that the kidnapper was a stranger. During the conversation, you could hear the kidnapper cussing at Denise and asking her where his phone is. It took about five minutes, but eventually he realizes that Denise has his phone and has called 911. The call goes silent. After discovering his daughter had been kidnapped, Rick immediately informed anyone and everyone he knew to be on the lookout for his daughter. He had Highway Patrol and even the Marshals Service out looking for Denise. Since Denise had the opportunity to call 911 using her captor's cell phone, Nathan was confident that the police would be able to track down their location using that phone. Unfortunately, the phone belonging to the kidnapper was a cheap prepaid cell phone, also known as a burner phone. This style of phone does not have the GPS tracking device that allows police to trace its location. The police were able to obtain pings from all of the nearby cell towers, which let them know that they were at least close by. Though useful, it was not enough information to track down Denise. Still, using the cell phone number, police were able to identify the owner of the phone, Michael King. Neither Nathan nor Rick recognized that name. Nine minutes after the 911 call, another operator received a call from a girl by the name of Sabrina Moxlow. And the girl came out of the, like, got out of the car, and my, co my dad's cousin went and put her back in the car, and when she got out... Okay, where's your, where's your dad's house? Um, it's in North Florida. Where would he be going with this female? He came over to my dad's house, borrowed a shovel, a gas tank, and found out. Sadly, at the time of Sabrina's call, Denise was only four miles away from the home. 
Not long after Sabrina's call, a 911 operator received a call from a woman named Jane Kowalski. That was around 6.30 p.m. Just inside the Charlotte County line from Sarasota County, Jane was traveling down US-41 along Florida's west coast. She came to a stoplight and suddenly heard what she thought sounded like a child screaming in terror coming from the car next to her. Jane looked over to see what was going on and for that moment made eye contact with the driver, a white male. What sounded like a child screaming to Jane was actually Denise screaming for her life in hopes that someone would hear her. And the driver was Michael King, but Jane had no way of knowing that. As Jane glared at Michael, a hand shot up and started banging on the passenger window. She watched in horror as the driver tried to subdue the person in the passenger seat. Immediately, Jane called 911, believing that she was witnessing a child abduction. 911, where's your emergency? Well, I'm on 41 going south, and uh, I'm going to do a cross street right now. It's at, I'm on Chamberlain, I just crossed Chamberlain, I'm on 41 going south, and I was at a stoplight, and a man pulled up next to me, and there was a child screaming in the car. Not a happy vehicle was he in. It's a blue Camaro. Having been near the Sarasota County line just moments ago, Jane thought her call went through to the Sarasota County Police Station, but it was actually sent to Charlotte County, where Denise's father, Rick, works. Jane did her best to stay with the driver and even attempted to get the license plate on the car while speaking with the operator. However, the operator was distracted and slow to respond during the call. Jane, we have your phone number. If we need you, we'll call you back. You'll be on that cell phone number if we need you, right? Absolutely, and don't hesitate. I'll give you whatever information I can give you. Okay, and we really appreciate you calling in. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, God, I hope this <laughs> man, oh, man. Okay. Thanks, um, Jane. All right, thank Just you. Drive careful. Oh, I shall. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. At one point, the male driver had pulled behind Jane, obviously realizing that she was on to him. Jane slowed down to 45 miles an hour in hopes of getting the suspicious driver to pass her so she could get his plate number, but all he did was drive slower. At some point during the call, the male driver pulled into the left lane and abruptly turned. Jane asked the operator should she try to follow the vehicle, but before receiving instructions, she lost her chance to get into the other lane and was blocked by traffic. Michael had gotten away. During the call, the operator could be heard relaying information to other people in the call center, but no one ever responded to Jane's call. Around 6.42 p.m., police went to Michael King's home. They broke into the house and found it empty, so the police began searching the property. During their search, they found a room that could only be described as a torture room. It was obvious that it had been recently used. Police found duct tape that had long strands of hair attached to it. Eight minutes later, yet another 911 call was made regarding Denise's abduction. This time, the caller was Harold Muxlow, Sabrina's father. Wanting to remain anonymous, Harold made the call on a payphone and refused to give his name. The information he provided to the operator was vague except for the description of the car, a green Chevrolet Camaro with a black cover on the front known as a bra. Is he going to hurt the girl? Uh, I don't. Did you, you saw them though? Yeah. And where, where was she? Uh, In the car? Was she okay? It turned out that Michael had visited Harold around 6 p.m., requesting to borrow a flashlight, a gas can, and a shovel. The reason being given was that his lawnmower had gotten stuck in the mud in his front yard. During this time, Denise was able to climb out of Michael's car. She began screaming at Harold to call the cops. Stunned, Harold didn't know what to do or think. Harold asked Michael what was going on, and he said, Nothing. Don't worry about it. After forcing Denise into the back seat of the car, Michael quickly got in the driver's seat and sped away. Harold knew his cousin had a history of bad relationships, so he initially chalked it up to a minor domestic dispute. Still, he was concerned. He decided to call his daughter Sabrina and told her what happened. She reacted by immediately calling 911. The situation Harold had witnessed with Michael was weighing heavy on his mind. He made the decision to go by his cousin's home to verify the lawnmower story. When Harold arrived at the house, there was no one home. 
Plus, there was, of course, no lawnmower stuck in the front yard. Harold realized he had been lied to, and at that point he decided to call 911 himself. Though Harold tried to remain anonymous on the 911 call, police soon pieced together that he was both Sabrina's father and Michael's cousin. As soon as police figured out Harold's identity and home address, they went over to the house and questioned him about what had happened with Michael and the woman that he had in his car. It was at this time that Harold told the police all that had transpired. The fact that Harold witnessed Michael and Denise together and had the best opportunity out of anyone to save her that day pains Denise's family dearly. At 9.16 p.m., a state trooper pulled over a vehicle matching Michael King's 1995 green Camaro with the black bra. Michael King was behind the wheel. He had finally been found, but he was alone in the car. Michael was pulled over about four miles away from the location where Jane, the driver who had called 911 on the road, had seen him. The trooper made Michael get out of the car. When he did, he saw that Michael was soaking wet from the waist down. On his person was a cell phone, but the battery had been removed. In the car, the trooper found a muddy shovel. At 9.30 p.m., Denise's father, Rick, received a call with the information that Michael King had been found. Rick hoped that meant that his daughter was now safe, but unfortunately, he was wrong. Though Michael King was finally located, he was not about to tell police what he had done. Instead, he claimed that he was a victim and had been abducted along with Denise by a stranger who had offered them a ride. Michael was taken to the police station where he was held for questioning. Hours after his arrest, Michael was allowed a visit from his cousin, Harold. During their visit, Michael gave his cousin his version of what happened that day. He told his cousin the same story he had told police. Michael said that he had attempted to call 911 while being held captive. He also claimed that he had no idea where the kidnapper had taken Denise because the kidnapper had let him go first and continued to drive off with Denise still in the car. Michael also tried to take the credit for Denise being able to call 911. During their conversation, Harold tried multiple times to convince Michael to take a lie detector test to prove his innocence, but Michael showed no interest, stating that he's not going to do anything until he gets a lawyer. While being interrogated, Michael mentioned a location he believed Denise had been taken. However, when police searched the area, they found nothing. Unconvinced by the story Michael gave to Harold, the police charged him with kidnapping. Two days had passed and there was still no sign of Denise. Many volunteers and police officers worked together to search and find her. About a half a mile from the location where the state trooper had picked up Michael, a canine unit discovered a freshly dug hole within a marshy field. In that hole, they found the naked remains of Denise Amber Lee. She had been shot in the head. After the discovery of Denise's body, her family expressed their gratitude and pain over their loss. With Denise recovered, police could now focus on putting together a profile on Michael King and try to figure out why he had targeted Denise. Michael King was 36 years old. He had moved from Michigan to Florida in 2002 after experiencing a painful divorce. He was currently an unemployed plumber who stopped going to work about three months earlier. Michael had no criminal history other than a few complaints made by neighbors who believed he had been pulling pranks around the neighborhood. During their investigation, police were able to get a hold of Patty Paul, the owner of a beauty salon in Venice, Florida, where Michael had been a regular customer. Patty described him as a quiet, modest customer, except for one disturbing visit where Michael had brought a girl with him who he said was only 15 years old. At first, Patty said she assumed the girl was a relative of his. That is, until they started kissing at the front desk. More disturbing complaints came out about Michael after that. Other witnesses claimed that Michael had exposed himself to a woman while at work. Another accused him of sexual assault. However, none of the events were ever reported to police. It was also discovered that Michael had spent two hours at a local gun range just a little while before he was seen pulling into Denise's driveway. 
After a few days, Jane, the woman who had believed she was witnessing a child abduction, called the Northport Police Department after recognizing Michael's picture on the news. Jane told them that that was the person she had called about when she thought she had seen a child abduction, but now realized it was Michael holding Denise down in the car. She wanted to know if they needed her to provide any further information, but no one at the Northport Police Department knew anything about the call that she had made as it had gone to Charlotte County. More so, no one at the Charlotte County Sheriff's Office where the call had been routed knew about her call either because the dispatchers had never sent it out. For the next two days, Jane kept calling the Northport Police Department until investigators finally managed to find records of her 911 call. During an internal investigation regarding Jane's 911 call, it was discovered that the operator who took the call realized that the call could be related to Denise's kidnapping. However, the operator never entered the information about the call into their computer system. All she did was shout it out to dispatchers across the aisle. The dispatchers who had heard her never sent out the tip. They claimed the chaos of that night was overwhelming and they forgot. To add insult to injury, multiple deputies were stationed near Michael's location at the time of the 911 call from Jane. In a sworn statement, one deputy said that he parked alongside Toledo Blade Boulevard at 6.35 p.m., which means Michael could have driven right past him, with Denise still screaming for her life in the back seat. This information weighs heavily on the friends and family who lost Denise. The sheriff of Charlotte County, John Davenport, refused to admit that his department was to blame for the missed opportunity to save Denise while she was driving down the Toledo Blade Boulevard. Instead, he said the chaos caused by the emotional stress of looking for one of their own in another case was the reason why Jane's call was neglected. Denise's father, Rick, however, disagrees. On the window so hard and screaming, trying to get help, which is a smart thing to do because by that time she knows she probably wasn't coming back. As far as I'm concerned, we blew it. And I say we because I'm part of that sheriff's office. Sheriff Davenport did make four of the call center workers take remedial training, and he suspended two dispatchers who took Jane's call for a few days. But the punishment meant little to nothing to Denise's husband. Denise's family believes that she did everything in her power to save her life that day, while the Charlotte County Police Station failed miserably. As if there wasn't enough evidence to prove this fact already, upon further investigating the Green Camaro, police found clues that were believed to have been planted by Denise. This evidence was found in the backseat of the Camaro. Police found strands of hair torn out by the roots matching that of Denise. They also found a heart-shaped ring that she had been given by Nathan on their very first Valentine's Day a ring that Denise never took off. More evidence would stack up against Michael, who was continuing to play innocent. A lab report showed a match between his DNA and that found on Denise's body. Not only was Michael now being accused of murder, but he was also being accused of sexual assault. Six days after Denise's abduction, a massive funeral was held in her honor. The entire town came together to pay their respects to Denise and her family. Questions about Denise getting abducted in broad daylight by a complete stranger continue to haunt her family. Though the evidence stacked up against Michael is immense, he pleaded not guilty during his trial. The family's questions remain unanswered. With all that had transpired throughout the desperate search for Denise and the many mistakes that were made, Nathan was not about to chalk up Denise's murder as an unavoidable death. He truly believed that more could have been done and should have been done by the police to save her life. In April of 2008, Nathan filed an intent to sue Charlotte County for their failure to save his wife due to their carelessness. His focus wasn't on the money that he would receive from the lawsuit, but to ensure that Charlotte County was held accountable for its mistakes. Rick, Denise's father, also took the stand to ensure mistakes like this never happen within the Florida 911 system again. Named after Denise, Rick pushed for the passage of a state law that would standardize training for call center workers. It was called the Denise Amber Lee Act. It passed unanimously on April 24, 2008. Unfortunately, this act only provides optional training for 911 operators. It does not mandate training and certification. 
To this day, Denise's family continues to push for the new law that would make the training and certification mandatory for all 911 workers. The investigation into Denise's murder found that Michael had aggressively sexually assaulted Denise multiple times in his home. He did so again right before shooting her in the head and burying her naked body in the ground. Medical examiners found several defensive wounds on her body and bruising on her wrists from where she was bound. Denise had been shot point-blank in the head, but medical examiners discovered that she did not die immediately. She had suffered before she died. Michael shot Denise above her right eyebrow, which caused her eye to explode. Blood had also entered her lungs, which signified that she was still breathing after being shot. After trial, Michael King was found guilty of sexually assaulting and kidnapping Denise on August 28, 2009. It took almost two years for the family of Denise to finally see her murderer condemned for what he had done. The punishment for the assault was 30 years. His sentence for kidnapping was life. His punishment for her murder was death. Though it was believed that Michael's death sentence would be carried out swiftly, he continues to sit in the Union Correctional Institution in Rayford, Florida. As of now, there is no indication whether he will actually be served his death sentence. The Charlotte County Sheriff's Department failed to help save the life of Denise Amber Lee. Now the justice system may fail to provide Denise and her family with the justice they deserve. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. We appreciate every subscription. Also, hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.